What's up, rockers? Welcome to another episode of the Talk Louder podcast, where we geek out on all things rock and roll. Hit that subscribe button on our YouTube channel. Leave us your likes and comments. You can also leave likes and comments on our Facebook page. Follow us on iTunes, Spotify, Instagram at talklouder underscore podcast. And of course, our website, talklouderpodcast.com. I'm Metal Dave Glessner, along with my co-host, Jason McMaster. And today we are joined by a glam rock royalty in the form of Mr. Sammy Yaffa from Hanoi Rocks fame. Of course, Sammy uh, is in the Michael Monroe band. He's been he's been Michael Monroe's right hand man for years and years and years since he was a teenager. And you could say the same in reverse. Uh, Sammy has been Michael's right hand man all those years as well. So he's joining us today to talk about the reissue of the 1982 Hanoi Rocks record, Oriental Beat. Uh, the album came out uh, again in 1982, and it was not up to the band's standards like so many bands earlier in their career. It was recorded on a shoestring budget. The band was not happy with the outcome. The master tapes disappeared for decades, and they recently resurfaced. So the band was able to remix, uh, repackage, reissue even resequence the tunes. We talk about that a little bit today too. Uh, so yeah, I covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time with Sammy Yaffa joining us all the way from Helsinki, Finland. Yeah. Um, awesome to have, uh, another legend uh, yes. in, in, in this, uh, zoom room. Um, I, uh, I don't think I was recording yet, but I, uh, had a fumble and I, I'm just being humble to my fumble by saying it was, it was as you were coming in, I started chatting with, with Sammy and I, I was, tr I was, I was trying to set up some things and I started talking about when, uh, in 87, 88, when the toys were, were in LA about to record the debut, uh, I saw, you know, posters and flyers all over the place and everybody looked like Hanoi rocks. And he actually, we talk about that in this episode, but, yeah. um, I mistook him for Andy because Andy was in this band called shooting gallery. And of course, uh, Sammy was in jet boy, right. uh, at that time. And, uh, so sorry about that, Sammy. Sorry, Andy. Sorry. Everybody, uh, <laughs> just had a little fumble there, but I wanted to be honest that that didn't get into, it won't get into the episode, but I thought it was, I'm laughing at with, with ourselves at myself. So well, you guys had a good laugh over it. Cause when I came, I joined into the conversation. You guys were already kind of laughing. at that. <laughs> Yeah. 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 He, uh, he has a really cool, uh, you can just tell by just chatting with him that he's very, uh, very straightforward, but, uh, will could probably get along with a rattlesnake. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like could probably find the good in, in anything and anyone. So I really enjoyed, uh, just hanging out with him for a half an hour and I learned a lot. Yeah. So uh, it was good. I'm glad that you were you were up on your, all of your your knowledge. Because well, I, I had so many things I could have asked him, but we had a limited amount of time. You know, uh, you mentioned Jet Boy. We did get to talk about Jet Boy a little bit with with Sammy, but he's played with the New York Dolls, Joan yes. Jett, Johnny Thunders. Uh, he had a band called Mad Wanna that I saw during South by Southwest. One he's year. the guy, uh, sorry to chop you off. He's the guy that it seems like that ilk of type of dirty rock and roll go-to guy. Yeah. He's a go-to guy. And he's a great bass player. He's sorely yeah, underrated yeah. in my opinion. Uh, but if you listen to any of the the Hanoi records or especially the Michael Monroe stuff that's come out in the past five years, there's a lot of cool bass playing going on underneath all that music. And yeah, and Sammy's just, I mean, I guess there's a reason he's a legend, dude. He's got swagger, style, he's cool, yeah, chill. Yeah, he's uh, kind of like a, if, if I squint, it's a little bit of a Pete Way vibe for some. Yeah, well, he, he's, so, he, he does like his Thunderbirds. Yeah, well, there, there's that's a big one there, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Had a great yeah. time today. Yeah, absolutely. Another legend, as you said, uh, we're starting to keep some pretty good company here on the Talk Louder podcast. Without further ado, Sammy Yaffa on today's episode of the Talk Louder podcast. <laughs>
stronzo. Stronzo? <laughs> yeah. It means piece of shit in Italian. It was uh, Mark Ford who ended up playing with Black Crow's played guitar and oh, Greg right. Long ended up playing with uh, Lenny Kravitz played the other guitar and, and Mickey Finn from Jet Boy and a bunch of other Hollywood personnel. Oh, yeah. All right. the cool, yeah. cool, cool, cool we, did, we did covers. We only did uh, Sex Pistols and Little Richard covers. It was a great band. Oh, my God. <laughs> that, uh, that, automatic fan. That's a great set. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, Sammy. Let's uh, – uh, we've got a little bit of time with you today. We want to make the most of it. I could talk to you for three weeks, but I'll, I'll spare you that. Uh, we want to talk today about the re-released, remastered, real mastered, as you're calling it, uh, reissue of the 1982 Hanoi Rocks record, Oriental Beat. And so the story goes that you guys were not happy with the album when it came out. The master tapes disappeared and somehow they mysteriously resurfaced and you guys were able to upgrade the album have we solved the mystery of how those master tapes were found? Who do we thank? Well, I think we can thank Michael for it. He did some detective work for it. And, uh, and also somebody um, at the Universal and also some Finnish guy like Hanoi fan. There was a weird fucking thing. It was like kind of Twilight Zone-ish. Somebody had seen something and then somebody took a photo and, and Michael got... Uh, in touch with Universal who had kind of bought the, uh, or integrated the record label that we made the album for back in uh, 1982. And those tapes, I think they disappeared around 85 or 86. They were sent to Germany for, I guess, for remixing or something of uh, the album. And uh, they just never came back, but then it turns out that they did come back, but I think it came, they came back after the label had been uh, taken into Universal. Is it so one of they, those? Uh, one of the uh, seller of Universal here in Finland. There it is. Wow, that was my that was my inquiry. I was wondering, like, they weren't like buried in the backyard. They were in a warehouse somewhere on a shelf. <laughs> <laughs> no, they were actually in the seller in the Universal Records over here in in Finland. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, I'm glad they resurfaced. I'm glad you're getting the opportunity to present the album the way you wanted to present it originally. Uh, we hear that all the time. A band, you know, early in their career goes in to record a record. They're on a shoestring budget. The album comes out and then they're like, ah, it's not what we wanted. Uh, the Dead Boys, yeah. of course, did that with Young, Loud and Snotty. Uh, but we're glad you were able to. Do that. We're glad you were able to uh, give it the upgrade. Uh, so did you. When it comes out, is it repackaged with a lot of new photos? And what does the physical album and the jacket and the sleeve look like? Because the Demolition 23 record you just did is amazing yeah. as far as all the extra goodies. Yeah, yeah it's, it's gorgeous. You know, it's going to be a great packaging. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it's, uh, I haven't got a copy yet because we actually just got a mail out yesterday morning that the pressing plants are backed up and so we're not going to be able to get the vinyl until I think about a month or two from now. It's an so, interesting, uh, that's an I interesting, uh, I, seen the initial, huh? it, I was going to say, it's an interesting uh, thing to hear that I hear quite often about the pressing plants being backed up all the time. Uh, I feel like resurgence of vinyl, in my opinion, I don't think there's ever been any like, vinyl low like uh, you know i i feel like vinyl's always been there because i have i have a hundred friends who do nothing but vinyl so they've been yeah. keeping everybody you know in in vinyl for a long long time but it's interesting to, that that's oh it's going to come out six months after we told you you know um i think yeah that, suppose it's because of covid suppose yeah. it's because of that it's it's kind of just like slowed everything down and shut everything down. And now everybody wants to put their records out. And, right. and there's not that many bands left anymore. Right. Because that's, they did disappear in the 90s and 2000s. You know, all the pressing plants, there's only a few left in the world now. So yeah, that's the reason for it. So you, you don't have a physical... And also, time. like all the bands and the artists, they, they didn't end up making vinyl anymore. It's, it's, uh, it was either CD or straight to uh, streaming. You know, it's, it's, uh, yeah. that's why it's, it's hard to find some records from vinyl nowadays. 
So you don't have a physical copy in your hand, but uh, you know what went to the plant. So is it going to come back with extra photos and lyrics and liner notes? And what does the repackage yeah. look like? Yeah, there's going to be a nice, nice new packaging. I think it's going to be a gatefold and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, it's going to have the original thing. And it's also going to be, we shuffled the uh, song order again. We were not really happy with the uh, the original side A and side B. So we uh, we turned that thing around, made it a little bit better. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because a lot of times albums get reissued, but they don't necessarily get resequenced. So what was the thinking? Why did you guys want to resequence the order of the tunes? Because we didn't, I mean, uh, well, we were like 19 or something when the record right. came out. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, decisions were made uh, sometimes for us, and, and uh, we didn't actually get the final record. We didn't get to check it out until it was in our hands as a vinyl, you know, as a product. And and the mix was not the mix that we wanted it to be in. And uh, it was just a big fucking mess, the whole thing, to be honest. Yeah. And uh, it, it really wasn't the sequence, I guess, that we wanted at the time. And, and, uh, and now that we had the chance to do it, we resequenced it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I always thought it was interesting that the album has a Hoyt Axton cover, uh, Lightning Bar Blues. Where does a band from Finland pick up the idea to do a Hoyt Axton cover? Brownsville uh, Station. Say again? Brownsville Station, the band. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. The same band that is smoking in the boys' room, they also did Lightning Bar Blues. No. Oh, I see. Okay. And the record, I think Andy had the record and we listened to it and, you know, I thought it was a great version of it. And, and uh, because the whole accident version is it's quite different than what we made. So we kind of made, went after the Brownsville Station version. Yeah, yeah. Um, I also, another side note on this album that I thought was interesting, you have Katrina from Katrina in the Waves is sings back up on this album. How did that happen? Uh, that was before she blew up, you know, it was like before she had all the hits and all that. And we just <laughs> happened to bump into her, you know, in, in a club somewhere. And, you know, she said she's a singer and, you know, and I think Andy got a tape or something and just invited her into the studio and sing the backups. It's a fucking weird thing. And then wow. suddenly she was kept on the waves, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she was, uh, had some big hits over here. I remember the video on MTV. Speaking yeah. of videos on MTV, one of the first ones I think I ever saw was Hanoi Rocks doing Up Around the Bend. That was, uh, that was, I yeah. think, one of the earliest videos on MTV. Yeah. It was still, yeah. It was just beginning the whole thing. Yeah. 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 I love that version. Yes. Yeah. Great. Up Around the Bend. Yeah. Up Around the Bend is, yeah. Like, oh, it, I mean, I love the CCR too, but you're, it's, it's fucking tight race. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right on. The great right on. You know, we, we, did, we did that. Uh, we had recorded the whole record with Bob Ezrin, you know, in New York and in Toronto, the two sisters from the move. That's and right. we were kind of lacking one song and uh, the label was like, kind of like, you know, do you want to do a cover of something? And, we're just like, oh, we think about it. And we went on tour in Germany, and the only tape that we had in the band was a best of CCR. <laughs> so we thought, that's a good one. <laughs> wow, that I never knew that. That's great. That's great trivia right there. What do you remember about the video shoot? Uh, I remember that Miss Finland came there with the, uh, the local Finnish kind of like a uh, music magazine honcho guy. And uh, we, we filmed it at the same place where uh, the Oasis uh, album covered the, the Be Here Now or whatever it is. Yeah. One yeah. of those, uh, the, the limo in, in, the, in the swimming pool. Right. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the same place where we shot the Hanoi Rocks uh, up around the band video. It's some kind of a country club in Kent or something, you know. <laughs> and uh, I just remember that that when that Miss Finland and that that music magazine Honcho walked into our little backstage area, there uh, Andy threw a bottle of cognac at him, and, and they just ran away screaming. <laughs> That's their introduction to Hanoi Rock. Get... 
yeah. <laughs> and uh, there's that little sequence where Nasty is coming down the road from the from the from the top of the building to the stage, and and I guess some stage hand had tried it first, you know, that it works fine and all this kind of stuff. But the stage hand was like a little guy, and he didn't have a heavy less fall on his neck. So when Nasty jumped in there, he's a big dude. And as he jumped on the fucking line, he got stuck halfway through. Oh. And it took like half an hour to get his ass down from there. You know, spinal tap. Glorious. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Go, going back to Oriental Beat, uh, tell me about the photo shoot for the album cover, because that's such an iconic image. And uh, for those who are listening and not watching, of course, we're talking about the the image with the red and blue paint handprints and the band's faces pressed up against the glass. Whose idea was this? How long did the photo shoot take and how messy was it to create that? I think this was all done in the same uh, day or two that we were in this in this place here in Finland. Um, in Helsinki, we shot the videos for Motivating and, and Tragedy and Oriental Beat, I think. And it was all like so low budget that it wasn't funny. I mean, all the moving shots on the, on the dolly was done with a guy sitting on a wheelchair, you know, and somebody pushing it. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, the, the cover was done. We, we knew that we needed a cover for the album, for the new album. And I can't remember who came up with the idea, you know, but it's kind of like, you know, the Stones album cover. Uh, is it true? There's one Stones cover where it's all kind of that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. So we kind of played with that and got some paint involved and went primal on it. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, well, it, yeah. I remember them very well. It's a great, it's a great image. It makes a great album cover. Um, I'm glad to see that you didn't rework the cover for the reissue of the album because the upgrade on the uh, Sonics is more than welcome, but I didn't want to see the album cover get messed with. Oh, it's, it's you know, times may change, but standards must remain. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Better keep them with the real thing, man. Um, what keeps you and Michael together? What is it, the chemistry between you guys? Cause you've been together since Hanoi rocks. And by the way, let me just uh, say congratulations on the last four or five Michael Monroe records going all the way back to sensory overdrive. I've said it before on this show. And I think you guys have the hottest streak in rock and roll as far as putting out great quality, consistent albums. And in my opinion, some of the best stuff of your career. And that's saying a lot. So, yeah. Uh, you've been with Michael for Hanoi. You did Demolition 23, Jerusalem Slim, uh, the Michael Monroe band. What is it about the two of you that works so well? I don't know. We got married 40 years ago. Oh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I don't know, we, just, uh, we have a good chemistry and things, and we think about making music the same way and, and uh, uh, much in the same way. Like, Doing make a rock and roll, we think about it very much in the same kind of way, and and we just get along really well. You know, it's so uh, we've been good at and all that. I lived in New York, and the connection never really ended. And when we did Demolition Twenty Three, it kind of stopped too soon. It it, it ended too soon. Yeah, and uh, we kind of thought that when we got back together. Dolls was kind of winding down, and and uh, kind of leaving <laughs> leaving the map and I, I met up with michael again in in uh in Turku, played here with the dolls in, in in finland and he came up on stage and blew some sax and harp with us and then we just hung out all night and, and just started talking about doing things again and, and kind of picking up from where we left it off with demolition 23 and, and then it turned into this great run you know first with ginger and then with dragon and then with rich jones and and it's just uh now it's just a solid package of good rock and roll and there's great writers in the band, you know, and everybody kind of contributes and all that. So it's, it's a good buy. Yeah. For, for my money, those, is it five records now since sensory overdrive, sensory horns and halos, blacked out States, uh, one man army. Yeah, okay. And yeah. I live too fast to die on five, five of the best albums of five, the last, yeah. you know, whatever the math is great stuff, oh, whatever wow. you're doing, keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned uh we can't we can't not ask you about jet boy so 
we're friends with the guys in Jet Boy. I've known Billy for a number of years. And every time we talk to them, they just they're, they're giddy when they talk about when the, when you joined the band, because you were obviously were a hero of theirs. But from your perspective, what were your ambitions when you decided to join Jet Boy? Well, life is a weird ass path of decisions made and, and listening to instinct and and uh, not maybe thinking too much about stuff and, and uh, just going for it. And when I got that call from, from Jetboy to come to LA and California, I was in a very weird place in my life. And I thought that I go on, I, I got the demos and I thought that there's definitely, you know, there's cool material in there and there's attitude and, and uh, you know, this could go somewhere. And also a band that has got a name taken from a New York Dose record, you know, can't be all bad, you know what I mean? So right. I flew over there just to check it out and, and uh, meet up with the guys and see how it goes. And they turn out to be sweethearts, all of them, you know, like super, super great guys. And there was a good buzz going on in, in LA at the time. You know, there was Guns N' Roses was just coming out with their record. And it was kind of weird because I, they took me out to Cat House like the first week when I got there. And I had no idea that Hanoi had, you know, this, this kind of influence on, on that whole scene over there. Like literally I had no fucking clue. So when I went to Cat House and there was like fucking 50 Michael Monroe's and 20 Andy McCoy's and, you know, 39 fucking nasty suicides. <laughs> It was, it was kinda, really fucking weird, man. Kind of showed, you know, kind of okay, you know. kind of showed that whole scene how to do it, in my opinion. More by the look, though. Yeah. Maybe not so much by the music. You know what sure. I mean? It's uh, music is quite different, but but uh, it's it's uh, with Jet Boy, it's, you know, they had a these a management team. They had we, you know, we had a label going on, Electro and all that, and made the record and you know and we had a good time and then everything turned into fucking shit pancake you know <laughs> it's uh <laughs> we got dropped by electro and uh the record was delayed by a year and you know i changed management and it just turned into this horrible business hassle you know which is really really bad it was it was a shame yeah i think uh jet boy like a lot of bands but maybe more so than most was a was a victim of bad timing because they did have uh, quite a bit of hype behind them, and they had the the songs and the and the image and the and the and the major label, but the tide had changed by the time everything you know finally surfaced after that delay. So, kind of got lost in the shuffle. And it was also a big talk. They yeah. didn't like that. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. We heard about it all the time. I was, well, you know, you should cut the mohawk off, and you know, uh, do like a big white hair. You know, it's it's a uh, People are going to think, like, what are you, punk or what? <laughs> so it's, it's, it was an issue. I remember that. I always thought that this is completely fucking insane, you know. It's a great look, man. You know, come yeah. on, have some balls. And let him do him, be himself, you know, let him do what he wants. And, you know, well, it's, it's it wild. Always... It's wild, but it's also kind of a classic, too, you know. Yeah. And, and it was attractive to the sound of the band as well. I feel like yeah. uh, the blues influence and the hard rock and, the, you know, the obvious, I mean, it, it you hear the hit that, you know, when the single came out, uh, feel the shake is what I'm talking about for listeners. Uh, I, it was an obvious, it was like a no brainer as to I am now, I, I, I have to buy the record now because this is, this song is speaking to me. Uh, the yeah. Mohawk was a secondary bone. The Mohawk was a bonus. You know, yeah. it's like, well, it's, exactly. yeah, yeah. It doesn't even have anything to do with what, I mean, I don't understand what, what the hang up would be about. Oh, he's got a mohawk, you know, like, like music has to do exactly with only the fact that he has a, mo no, has nothing to do with it. But, uh, a, it was, yeah. a, it, like I said, it was a cherry on top of the ice cream, you know, for us, it was, yeah. but you yeah. know, for, yeah. for as far as marketability and the funny thing is that five or six years later, it would have been just normal because then you had Marilyn Manson and Rob Zombie and all these people that looked even weirder. <laughs> and that was big yeah. business all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, exactly. Sammy, tell us a little bit about your uh, autobiography, Sammy Yaffa, The Road Bends. How long did it take you to write your book? And what, what did you sort of, how did you balance what to include and what to leave out? Uh, lawsuits. 
<laughs> He's honest. Straight answer. Yeah. No, it's, it's, uh, the book goes until 2015. I wrote it. Um, it took me about four years to kind of, you know, it wasn't four years of constant writing, you know what I mean? It's, it's I would start and then for about a couple of weeks and then stop. And, and suddenly I realized I had uh, I'd gone from like my birth until 2010. I had so much stuff that I realized I needed some help with it. And I got, got in touch with a friend of mine, this Finnish writer over here who kind of edited it and put it together and, and you know, made it so it's not thousand pages, you know what I mean? And uh, made it made it readable. And then it took another, you know, it's it's uh, I got I got contacted by Rare Bird about I think it's now about two and a half, three years ago, something like that. And we went through the, uh, you know, we went through trying to find a, a good translator for it because it's not easy to translate from Finnish lingo into my weird English. <laughs> and I really wanted it to sound like, in both books, to sound like me. You know, I didn't want it to sound like, you know, somebody wrote it for me. Right. So that's why it took a little while. And, and uh, the same thing with the English translation. It took a little while to get it right. Um, um, yeah. It was, it, was a, it was a journey and a half, man. It really was. Yeah, I, I can imagine, especially when you've got as many stories to tell as you must have. Uh, th there comes a point where you're like, this thing could turn into 5,000 pages, or I need to find some someone to help me edit it down to something manageable. Yeah, exactly. Tell us about your solo record. Um, the innermost what is it the innermost journey to your outermost mind so first of all i have to ask you what's the significance to the, the okay i was just going to ask what's the significance oh, to man. the title <laughs> <laughs> for those who aren't watching uh, we just got a visual clue but explain the origins of the title and then tell me what side of you as a musician you you were hoping to express in your solo record well, I kind of was hoping to express all of them. And that's why the record is so kind of varied. You know, it's, it's like I grew up, you know, on Clash and I grew up on Stones and I grew up on The Ruts and stuff like that. When there, it wasn't kind of like generous, genre specific, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, you could, you could have on the same record, like on the call, you can have Sky, you can have Jazz, you can have old school rock and roll, you have punk rock, you can have everything you want. As long as it does has, as long as it has kind of a you know red thread through it, you know that it still sounds like the same band, same guy. So I kind of took that as my uh, my lead on, on putting the record together, and I just wrote a bunch of stuff that felt natural. And there's a little bit of you know gypsy punk in there, and uh, there's reggae in there, and there's a little bit of Tom Waits in there. There's a, a lot of punk in there. There's some heavy riffy rock and stuff like. That that and it's, it's just uh, once I had the songs together I realized that this is going to flow really, really nicely together you know it's, it's, it's a journey it's not just like you're going to listen to one song and they go oh my god what the fuck is this next it doesn't fit it all fits and it goes into this little cool little journey so it was a lot of fun putting that shit together it really was yeah yeah and the title came to me uh, I woke up one morning and I was like there it is <laughs> I mean we did uh, the, the Dolls record, you know, New York Dolls record. It's it's uh, when David Johansson came into the studio and said, I got the title. <laughs> we were like, well, what is it? One day it will please us to remember even this. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, yeah, yeah, but what's the title? <laughs> <That's> the title. <laughs> so I kind of come from the David Johansson school of time. I love it. I love it. Uh, another sidebar I wanted to ask you about, and I think you and I had some discussion online about this. I, I'm a big Jesse Mallon fan, and I had no idea that you were on the Glitter from the Gutter album. And then yeah. I heard about that and I asked you online and you responded. And of course, I dug through my, my CD and I found your name on the credits. And so... My question is, were you uh, in the studio when Bruce Bring uh, Springsteen contributed to uh, Broken Radio? No. No. It was, it was kind of a surprise. You know, we did, uh, we did all the, the backing tracks for the record in, uh, in the studio upstate New York somewhere. We spent about a week 
10 days over there. And then I went on the road with the dogs and, you know, I got busy with that stuff and I didn't really stay in touch with Jesse too much about the, the rest of the record. And, and then, you know, he comes up and it's like, oh yeah, you know, I got the record, you know, and, you know, Bruce came on it. I was like, what? It's like, I'm going to fucking say so with fucking Springsteen, you know? It's uh, it was, it was pretty cool. I wish I'd been there, but no. Okay, I was just curious because that would have been uh, a once in a lifetime experience, obviously. Oh, yeah. um, so back to Hanoi Rocks real quick, and then we'll let you go. For Michael's 60th birthday, you did a reunion performance of the original Hanoi. Um, yeah. So now we've got the re-released version of Oriental Beat. So the obvious question is, will we get any live gigs to promote the re-release of this album and how did that reunion go for you, by the way? Were there any were there any glitches behind the scenes that we didn't see as spectators? No, it was it was really cool. We all came to this thing like, you know, this is gonna be a one-off and it's gonna be for Michael. That's that was the whole point of doing it. It's it's uh, it's just out of respect for Michael. And, and we knew that he wanted to, you know, to to throw a, a big party for it. And, and uh, we were first at first we were going to keep it a secret, but then we thought like, well, what the fact? You know, it, it wouldn't be fair for the fans and all that. So, and uh, Chief Casino, he hadn't played for a long time. I mean, for for years. Yeah. And at first he was a little bit concerned if he can pull it off. And I guess he went into the. <laughs> he said he's going to go in and rehearse, you know, and then practice the songs and. When he came to the rehearsals, you know, we started rehearsing about I don't know, five days before the gig. And uh, it was a little bit, oh, shit, man. I was like, did you really rehearse? So, like, well, you know, I went there, you know, to rehearsal space. And, you know, I had those, like, you know, earbuds. And, but once I started playing with the drums, I couldn't hear the music anymore. So I gave up. So I thought, like, I, I rehearsed with you guys. <laughs> so he didn't really rehearse. So, you know, we had, we had really intense, like, three days of rehearsals, but, you know, all with a really good vibe. And, and it was really funny because we hadn't been in the same room in 40 years, almost, yeah. you know, with Jim. And uh, it was it was really cool. It was that the same dynamics came to play. And everybody had mellowed out, of course, a little bit, you know, with age, you know, a little bit, but still the same, you know, People are the same. People don't change. <laughs> yeah. You know? So, yeah. so it was a one-off, or can we can we say never say never? I say never say never because I don't have a crystal ball, and you know, life is a trippy ass journey and all that. But you know, but yeah. right now it was uh, the idea was that it was just a one-off. So I've asked Michael, and I want to ask you, uh, given Michael says that one of the reasons the Michael Monroe band and many other bands from overseas have a hard time touring your or touring the United States is because of the expense. And he said that the really the only way you could guy, you guys could do it is if you were opening for a huge, huge band. And I, the question for me is, well, why doesn't Guns N' Roses call you guys? Well, we did a last summer. We played with them at the uh, Wembley Stadium. You know, we we were supposed to do two gigs with them, but one got blown off because of something. I don't know why. But uh, yeah, we did that. But at the same time, I'm not sure what Michael means with that. It's it's it would mean that that big band would pay us a lot of money, and that doesn't usually happen for the support acts. What I know about opening for big bands and acts, yeah, that's not that's not that's not how it works. Financial financial doesn't mean a bigger band is going to pay you more. You you, no. you you would usually make more in a, on your own. Yeah, it's exactly. you. Yeah, yeah. It's usually it's it's still the practice of pay to play. You know, it's it's uh, it's still the same shit. But it's, it's for us. It's like we do really well on the on the East Coast and West Coast. But but otherwise, I mean, if we go and play in St. Louis, you know, there's like three guys with Metallica T-shirts on. You know, it's, it's not really worth going over there. You know, it's uh, it's a shame, but it's it's just the cost, you know, for the uh, working permits and the flights, you know, blah blah, hotels and buses and all that. And we are basically a club level band, you know, in, in the states. You know, we don't play arenas or anything like that. So it's, it's very difficult for us to come over. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, I can I can appreciate that. We did see you uh, when you came to Austin a few years ago for part of South by Southwest. And it was I said at the time that show that you did at the Rusty Spur, it was a daytime afternoon show and Cheetah Chrome got on stage and joined yeah. you. And I think that is probably still in the top five greatest shows I've ever seen in my life. That was the talk of the town. Yeah, my top five shows I haven't done. Absolutely. Oh. Yeah, See, there it's, you go. Wow. Something. That was amazing. Absolutely amazing. So if we don't get you back anytime soon, I can at least live with that memory. But I'd really like to see, you know, at least Michael Monroe band come back to the States, if not a Hanoi reunion. Um, but I understand the uh, the financials involved in all that. Tell everyone. Fact, the government grants from Finland, Finnish government, they give grants. Come on, Finland, give us a grant. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. We'll make a few phone calls for you. Yeah, man. <laughs> Come on it. Tell everybody where they can find everything Sammy Yaffa. Uh, you have a website. Tell us where that yeah, is. Yeah, SammyYaffa.com, but I never updated it, so that's not the place. It's uh, probably just called Instagram Sammy Yaffa Official or uh, with, uh, uh, Facebook Sammy Yaffa Official. That's it. Gotcha. Yeah. All right, man. Well, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us all the way from Finland today. I don't, what time is it over there? No, it's uh, half past eight. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, thank you for uh, spending some of your evening with us. We totally appreciate it. Uh, I can't wait to get the new updated version of this Oriental Beat, the 1982 album from Hanoi Rocks, finally getting the treatment it deserves. Anyway, thank you again very much. It's a pleasure to see you. Pleasure to have you on the show. Always appreciate it. And we wish you continued success with everything you do. On behalf of my co-host, Jason McMaster, I'm Metal Dave Glessner, along with our very special guest today, Sammy Yaffa on the Talk Louder podcast. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank appreciate you, Sammy. It.